Welcome to this video in which we will describe an approach to interpreting x-rays in the orthopedic setting with a specific focus on the radiological assessment of fractures. Before introducing our approach to x-ray interpretation, the term fracture should be defined. A fracture is the interruption in the continuity of bone which may or may not be associated with adjacent soft tissue injury. The soft tissue injury may be closed or open to the environment. The ABCS acronym is useful when interpreting an x-ray. The adequacy, bone, cartilage or joint and soft tissue are all important aspects to assess. With regards to this video, the bones are the most important. However, they should never be considered in isolation. Step one of our ABC's approach is adequacy. Here, the film and patient details should be assessed before looking at the radiological image. Patient details are largely recalled for practical reasons to ensure that the viewed x-ray is in fact an image taken from the desired individual. Consequently, it is important to report the patient's name, age or date of birth, sex, and possibly their hospital folder number for the dual purpose of identification and provision of brief clinical context. The details of the film, such as the date on which it was captured, as well as the side of the body and view it depicts, are equally important to consider before diving into the assessment of the various bones and displayed soft tissues. A useful memory aid to utilize at this stage is the rule of twos. The rule of twos dictates five criteria, which should be fulfilled in order to adequately assess an affected site. It calls for two views of the area, usually AP and lateral, and for two joints to be visible in the resulting film, that is the joint above and below the potential fracture site. Additionally, this principle states that best practice calls for x-ray of both limbs for the sake of comparison, which is particularly important in children where growth plates may be affected. It is also useful to note that when possible, previously taken x-rays of the affected area should be considered for the same purpose of comparison from baseline. As is always the case in the medical field, it is often useful to get two opinions on the same radiological film to confirm the validity of the made assessment. Finally, this approach calls for x-rays on two occasions particularly in the case of fractures before and after reduction or the application of therapeutic interventions. As mentioned, the view of the produced x-ray is an important thing to consider as part of your radiological approach, and while AP and lateral images are by far the most widely employed, specific views may need to be requested depending on the site of the suspected injury, as outlined in the list provided. In summary, the adequacy of an x-ray can be deduced by reporting the details of the patient and the details of the film. An example of how to present these findings has been included here. Please feel free to pause the video at this point to ensure that you have grasped this initial step of the approach to an orthopedic x-ray. The B component of the ABCS approach focuses on bones, and here you can comment on the bone density and the presence of any fractures. To assess the bone density, it is best to adopt an outside-in approach. Begin by looking at the outline of the bone or the cortex, looking for any signs of bone degeneration or bone growth as seen in these examples. After assessing the bone contour, look for the presence of any lesions within the bone. And if present, describe these in relation to the surrounding bone. Lesions can be sclerotic, meaning they appear hyperdense in comparison to the surrounding bone, or they can be lytic, appearing hypodense in relation to the surrounding bone as a result of disintegration. Or they can have features of sclerotic and lytic lesions, in which case they are a mix. While assessing the bone, you may come across fractures, and these should be described in as much detail as possible with the help of these six steps outlined. Firstly, begin by identifying any soft tissue involvement by indicating if the fracture is open or closed. In other words, does it communicate with the external environment or not? And if it does, and it's considered open, provide the Gastillo Anderson grade. Then describe the position of the fracture. Is it in the proximal or distal aspect of the bone? Is it in the epiphysis, metaphysis or shaft in the case of a femur fracture? Or in the PIP or DIP in the case of a hand fracture, for example? You should then classify the fracture, indicating if it is complete or incomplete and describing its pattern. This will be elaborated on in the next slide. Describe the exact bone that is involved. Is it the humerus, the femur, the tibia or the fibula? And is it on the left or the right? Comment on any displacement of the bone, with reference to Lara, which will also be elaborated on in a bit. And finally, look to see if there is any growth plate or intra-articular involvement. After taking this all into account, you will have described the fracture quite comprehensively. But remember that x-rays supplement a history and examination. Thus, you should also be able to comment on whether it is pathological or stress fracture based on the history provided and comment on the neurovascular status of the limb affected. To classify a fracture, first identify if it is complete or incomplete. Does it communicate with the cortex on either side of the bone or not? 
Complete fractures can then be simple, segmental, or complex. Simple fractures consist of a single fracture line and can be transverse, running horizontally through the bone. This is often the result of a direct blow. Oblique, running at an angle through the bone, often due to shearing forces. Or spiral, where it appears to corkscrew around the bone, and this often occurs due to rotational injury. Segmental fractures, on the other hand, occur when there are more than two fracture lines, creating a tubular segment in the shaft. And complex or comminuted fractures are those that consist of multiple fragments that usually occur due to high energy injuries. And these are unstable fractures as they lack lateral and longitudinal stability. In contrast, fractures can also be incomplete. And for the purpose of time, I'll just focus on two that are common in the pediatric population. They are green stick fractures, which occur when the bone deforms without breaking completely, and this is made possible by the elasticity of children's bones, and buckle fractures, which occur when the cortex of the bone buckles under a compression load, but there is no loss of continuity or deformity of the bone. The fifth consideration of the bone portion of our approach relates to displacement, which describes how the distal part of the bone has moved relative to the proximal portion, reported in each of the possible planes of movement. Lara will prove a useful mnemonic when considering all of the directions in which a bone can be displaced. The L refers to the net change in the length, also regarded as the degree of shortening, of the injured bone compared to the uninjured side, usually as a result of malunion, as depicted in the leftmost image, or impaction, as seen in the rightmost image. A denotes apposition, which is the movement of the edges of the fractured bones away from each other in the horizontal plane, a movement which is quantified as a percentage of the total bone width, as shown in the drawing alongside. The R of Lara refers to rotation, that is, displacement in the axial plane of the bone, which is the one parameter that is assessed more appropriately by clinical rather than radiological means. Our final A relates to angulation, which is the change in the axis of the pieces of the fractured bone in relation to one another. This form of displacement, like apposition, can be quantified. Here, however, degrees are used to describe the movement, with the proviso of dorsal versus palmar, varus versus valgus, or radial versus ulna, providing additional information related to the direction of the angulated shift. The C of the ABCS approach refers to cartilage and joints, and prompts you to look on for any subluxation or dislocation of the joints and any degeneration of the joint space. So, what's the difference between subluxation and dislocation? Well, a dislocation refers to the complete loss of articulation of two opposing bones that comprise a joint, while subluxation refers to an incomplete or partial dislocation where the two bones remain in contact, though not completely. In terms of a degeneration of the joint space, it's important to look out for features of osteoarthritis, such as narrowing of the joint space, new bone formation with osteophytes evidenced on the bone edges, subchondral sclerosis evidenced by hyperdensity of the bone, and subchondral cysts, which are seen as hypodense cysts near the articulating surfaces. The last step of the ABCS approach involves looking at the soft tissues. Abnormalities to look out for include the presence of foreign bodies, discontinuity of the skin surface or the surface of dressings, which could imply a wound, gas, which can be seen due to an open wound or due to infection, and swelling, a possible sign of infection, hemarthrosis, or joint effusion. Here is an example of a foreign body. Pictured is a lateral x-ray of the C-spine, showing a foreign body sitting behind the C3 and C4 vertebrae. The x-ray on the left-hand side shows subcutaneous emphysema, which has many possible causes. The x-ray on the right shows an overt example of soft tissue swelling occurring medially at the distal portion of the right foot. The last portion of this video involves some case examples of fractures and descriptions thereof, based on the approach outlined in this video. Thank you very much for watching.